Hi. So <laughs> I think some of you will recognize this picture. It's one of many famous images of the sky over Chelyabinsk, Russia, back in February 2013. Now, that morning, a huge fireball lit the sky, and a rock 20 meters in length, weighing over 10,000 tons, hit the Earth's atmosphere and exploded with the power of several atomic bombs. And for many people, when they woke up that morning and read the news, it was the first time in really a while that the media focused on uh, you know, what was beyond the Earth's atmosphere, what's in space, and so on. But for people like me, and scientists and astronomers, this is the kind of stuff that we think about every day. And I want to talk to you today about the work that I've done to organize and analyze the information that we have on these objects, as well as even potentially discover new ones, similar to the one that exploded over Russia. And as part of this journey, I'm going to show you how I use JavaScript um, to make all this possible. But before we get into the good bits, I need to give you some background on space and asteroids in general. Uh, so we'll go through that quickly. But basically, asteroids are just rocks in space, right? They range from anywhere between a couple meters in size to hundreds or even a thousand kilometers in diameter. And most of them reside between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter in what's known as the asteroid belt or the main belt. And there are some that are closer to Earth's orbit called near-Earth objects or NEOs. And of these, about 2,000 of them are known as potentially hazardous objects, which means that there is some probability that they could collide with Earth. So we keep a close eye on them. Asteroids are not just these big existential threats, though. They're the remnants of a primordial solar system, one that formed over 4 billion years ago. So they contain basic elements like hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. You have water, you have silicates. And then you also have things like platinum group metals, um, cobalt, nickel, iron, magnesium. And just to give you a sense of scale, we're looking at a false color image of Vesta, which is 500 kilometers in diameter. And a lot of these uh, materials are present in greater qu quantities and concentrations than we find on Earth. And the reason for that is they don't go through the typical weathering processes that we normally see here on this planet. And uh, this, this, uh, the bountiful nature of our solar system and all these rocks in them uh, is well known to a lot of people who have a lot of money to throw around. So Planetary Resources is an example of a company that actually wants to go out and collect these resources from asteroids. And they're backed by Google CEOs Eric Schmidt and Larry Page. Um, so I guess where do I come in to this? Uh, I should give you some background on myself. I am a software engineer at Google. Prior to that, I was an early engineer at a company that was acquired by Google. I built some software that I'm going to tell you about that um, that analyzes and organizes this information on asteroids and sold it to planetary resources. Now I focus a lot on uh, data visualization and analytics for this kind of data. But a couple of years ago, I was just out of school. It was like 2012, and I was having a life crisis, like a midlife crisis, because I realized that... <laughs> this is, I mean, this is something that's very common for people our age. But I realized that my life was entirely meaningless, and I wasn't doing anything that great. But I was reading a lot of really cool articles on asteroids and space. And that stuff is something that I've always been really into for a long time. So I realized that it was, there are about 750,000 asteroids in our solar system. And even though we know a lot about them, it's actually very hard to ask basic questions like, which one is going to hit us next? Or which one is the easiest to get to? Or which one, if I were an asteroid mining billionaire, would give me the best return on investment if I went out to get it. So I built something called Asterank. And the reason why it's called Asterank is because I wanted to rank asteroids based on any arbitrary query that you supply, right? So I collect all this data and make it easy to organize, browse, and visualize. That's the point of the Asterank platform. But the thing that is really the most important to me is building a way for the public to engage with space. And I think if there's one thing that I want you to take away today, it's that this part is what makes the data and what makes space and asteroids and all that stuff come to life. And that's where JavaScript comes in. So some background on how Asterank actually works. The first step is to gather the data. So data from places like NASA JPL, the Minor Planet Center, about a dozen other scientific sources, as well as economic sources like the London Metals Exchange and other places like that. 
I bring it all into a database and put it into what I call my unified data model. It's just one ground source truth of information that contains everything that we know about asteroids. Next step is to run calculations. So basically, I wrote functions that were mapped over each of these asteroids, estimated things like composition, uh, mission cost value, uh, how hard it is to get to an asteroid, how much rocket fuel you need to spend, that sort of thing. And I put it all together. The end result is something that looks like this. It's a giant spreadsheet written in JavaScript. And it's, but the, the key thing here is that um, even though it's not the, maybe the, the prettiest thing, it's the first time that all this data has been available and in one place, and it's something that you could actually point and click and browse through this information. So this was an Angular web app. I'm a more visual sort of person, though. So I turned to a technology called WebGL, which is uh, essentially OpenGL in the browser. So this visualization is scientifically accurate. It runs in your, in your browser, in Chrome, Firefox, on your laptop, even some mobile devices. And it's written mostly in JavaScript on top of WebGL. And everything that you see here is scientifically accurate. So this is where JavaScript becomes powerful, right? You can actually go in and view these objects in context to understand the solar system, understand how these asteroids are distributed along the plane of our solar system. And it's really a, a beautiful, fun thing to play around with in your browser. My favorite view, though, is actually the accessibility view, which we're about to switch to. So the accessibility view is interesting because it shows you which asteroids are the easiest to get to from Earth. And you can see here how they sort of cluster around the Earth's orbit. And the, I think one of the most amazing takeaways here, one of the things that you can see, is that there are actually 2,000 asteroids that are easier to get to in terms of energetic cost than the moon. So 2,000 asteroids that are more within reach, easier to get to than the moon was 46 years ago. And I think it's pretty remarkable that we can see this on a web page and see that result. It's not just a toy, though. So when you, pa when you pair it with the data view, it becomes a very powerful tool to actually go through and view all this information in context. So you can do things like um, you know, view all the upcoming approaches, the composition. You can look at the upcoming passes and notice how they sort of cluster around the Earth to begin with. So these are the ones that, uh, in theory, we may want to watch out for or we want to study. Also, you can look at things like the smallest asteroids. So this is of interest to NASA, because they're interested in asteroid capture. I think the, the biggest thing here is that space is really just beautiful, and it's full of opportunity, right? And what I learned, and I'll go more into the technical details, is how to take some data and turn it into uh, I think, a beautiful visualization that people can actually touch and interact with and learn from. So that's the power of putting things in the browser. I'll go, uh, I mean, so I, I built all of this, and then I realized, like, how are asteroids actually discovered? We're discovering them at a rate of about one or two per day, and it's mostly done by uh, these big sky surveys, so these academic or government-funded institutions that run these algorithms. They, they take big pictures of the sky and run an algorithm that was probably written in the 90s that spots an asteroid or doesn't spot it. If it doesn't see an asteroid, then, uh, then it's put into storage. And we have terabytes and terabytes of sky survey imagery that no one has ever looked at again. And we know these algorithms are pretty low precision. And even if an algorithm finds an asteroid, spots an asteroid in sky survey imagery, it, is, uh, it has to be verified by a human. So I took a lot of this imagery and scraped it from, from these websites, from these databases, and built an app called Asterank Discover to crowdsource sky survey imagery um, from these millions of sky survey images, these, these gigabytes um, and even terabytes of sky survey imagery, and basically, I did. I went through the basic process of stacking and blinking, which is how asteroids are discovered now. You put two uh, pictures of the night sky on top of one another, and then you compare them as time passes. So the way it looks like, this is a video, um, if you look very closely, you can see the asteroid moving against the static background of the night sky. And this is how 
asteroids are discovered. And now you can do that online as well. This is, uh, this is a Canvas app built using uh, Kinetic JS, which was uh, a lot of fun to build. Uh, what's the point of this? Well, by now, um, I have several million page views. Uh, millions of people have seen this. Uh, we reviewed a quarter million sky survey images this way, which I hope is a significant contribution to science. Over 10,000 or nearly 10,000 objects have been marked as potentially interesting, uh, which could boil down to maybe a couple tens of new asteroids discovered. And the, my favorite part about this is that whoever spots it first gets to name the asteroid. So you can come up to me afterwards and tell me what you name your asteroid. Um, Asterank is used in a bunch of different schools and universities. It's used by companies that are looking to raise money to go to space. And uh, there are hundreds of developers who either follow or contribute to Asterank on GitHub. So it's open source, it's all MIT licensed, um, and it wouldn't be where it is today without the contributions um, of a lot of enthusiastic people in the open source community. So, the, like, I didn't just wake up one morning and write all this. I actually had no idea what I was doing. And I still have no idea what I'm doing as far as, um, like, I knew, I, knew, I knew a little uh, JavaScript. I didn't know anything about visualization. I didn't know anything about astronomy. Um, so the, the process of putting this together was very slow and painful and involved a lot of trial and error. There are a couple of things I learned along the way. Um, starting out, this was, it was just a D3 visualization. So it was just a top-down visualization, two-dimensional. And I realized that, I don't, know, I don't know what this tells you other than there's like a lot of stuff out there. Um, and it's sort of like interesting to, to look at. I turned it into a canvas visualization. It, it did about, uh, it, could, it could accurately simulate about 10 or 20 of these top asteroids that I, that I picked before my computer started to melt. Um, and then I eventually got things a little better so that it could do maybe 1,000 or 2,000 and get to that point. And then uh, I did even more stuff, and it more or less got to the point where we're at today. So things that I learned, the biggest thing is probably that the web is essentially single-threaded. You can, you can think of it as a single thread because everything that you do in your JavaScript is going to block the user, and it's going to block the rendering that you're doing in your visualization, or even just you know, like the normal stuff that you do on the web page in your web apps. So when you're in a performance-sensitive sort of situation, you have to be extremely conscious of this. Uh, there are a couple of ways to, um, to sort of alleviate this burden. The first step is smart asset handling. So load a bunch of stuff at the same time, only load what you need. This stuff is mostly self-explanatory, uh, but it's an obvious first step when you start running into performance issues. The next two things I'm going to talk about are web workers and time processing. So we'll get into web workers first. Web workers are, you can, you can think of them as sort of separate threads in the browser. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping between um, your web worker and an operating system thread, but it's essentially the same thing. So your web worker won't block the UI. And what that means is that you could perform CPU-intensive computations without having to, um, to block the user. So the web page still act smoothly, you can still um, you know, be responsive to button presses, scrolls, and that sort of thing. The way that the UI thread communicates with web workers is by serializing messages back and forth. So on the UI side, we create a worker, and then we post a message. In this case, I'm just saying, just sending basic data, foo and bar. This is the information that I want to send to my web worker. That goes across the wire to the web worker. And then on the worker side, we have an event handler that receives messages, right? So I can receive this data, I can unpack it, and eventually I can do work on it. In this case, I'm doing a very basic operation. I'm just testing for equality. But you can do whatever you want. This is where your CPU-intensive code happens. And then I respond. I say that I got the message. And that goes right back to the UI thread. And on the UI side, um, I receive the message, and all I do in this case is I log it to the console. So that was, a, that was like a super fast summary of web workers, but it really is that easy. There are a couple caveats. First step is that um, serializing messages is fairly costly, right? So communicating from between uh, the UI thread and web workers, if you have a lot of data, 
um, that's something that's going to slow down your application because that still will burden, will, you know, is CPU intensive on the UI side. So you want to reduce that. And for that reason, usually one worker is enough. The returns that you get don't scale linearly based on the number of workers that you've added. Other downsides to web workers is that you don't get to touch the DOM. That includes basic uh, things like the window object, like the console object. The stuff that you're used to dealing with is not available to you in the web workers. So you sort of have to build something to uh, you know, like pass back your, the messages that you want to log and so on. And finally, web workers aren't available in all browsers. Um, so if you're supporting IE6, you're sort of out of luck. But you can, you can do things to, um, to uh, sort of shim that and make it a little easier. Uh, the next thing is timed array processing. So what this typically looks like is you have a ton of data that you either want to process or display, right? It's either user supplied or it comes from a server um, or anything like that. The basic idea is to break it up into smaller chunks. This is fairly intuitive. But the place where it's not intuitive is when you run into a, um, a case like this, right, where you're just looping over a very large array. It's important to understand that looping over the large array does not ever give the UI a chance to catch up to whatever the user is doing, whether it's um, interacting with the visualization or even if they're just scrolling or pressing a button or typing on their keyboard. So this will lock up the CPU. The solution is something called timed array processing. And this is sort of a lot of code to digest at once, but the basic idea is that uh, you want to use set timeout to yield execution flow back to the browser. And this may be a familiar concept to some of you who have desktop programming backgrounds, where you, have to, uh, where you might occasionally um, do, do events in a, in a thread or that, um, that blocks the <coughs> UI. Um, so in this case, I process as much data as I can, either until I'm out of chunk space or until uh, I'm out of time. And then I just call set timeout. And that lets the browser catch up with whatever it is that it's doing. So this is timed array processing, or at least an example of it. I eventually started using WebGL. So the, uh, the, the best, I think, general framework for WebGL is called 3.js. It's what I use for Asterank. Um, there are a couple caveats for WebGL um, and, and these WebGL libraries. I would say that you should focus on putting everything that you can on the GPU. So this means writing shaders for your WebGL uh, applications. Because 3.js abstracts a lot, of, um, a lot of WebGL, makes it super easy to use. But it also means that it's easy to um, dump too much on the CPU. So focus on your shaders. Um, monitor your FPS and selectively add and remove features based on how the client is doing. Uh, that's a, another thing that is actually very easy to do, but could give you great returns. Uh, also, just be careful with uh, cross-browser or even operating system things, because there's a lot going on in WebGL under the hood, uh, more so than just your normal browser compatibility sort of issues. And if you're using 3.js, use a particle system, because that offloads a lot of work to the GPU. You can put these all together and improve your performance of your asteroid visualization by 10,000 times. I think that a lot of these, um, a lot of these tips are probably uh, very broadly applicable, right? Whether you're doing visualizations or if you're just doing some potentially CPU intensive work um, on, on your, in whatever apps that you're building. So sort of as a case study, I wanted to apply these same concepts to a different visualization. And I wound up taking a data set uh, of 2 billion cubic light years. So everything that you see in this visualization, every point of light, is a galaxy. And this data is produced by the Millennium Run, which was at the time was the largest n-body physics simulation in history. And you can see here the scale, at, at this scale, these are the largest structures in the universe. This is how gravity shapes our universe. And um, it's like really cool, really cool, beautiful stuff. But we're looking at millions and millions of galaxies. And that's something that will really tax your, uh, your computer um, or your graphics card. 
and so on. So mainly what I learned from this is that uh, you want to offload as much as possible from your, your JavaScript work. So you want to do a lot of pre-processing, do things like grouping particles um, in order to minimize the amount of work that the client needs to do. So what I did was I used an R-tree, which is a spatial data structure, figured out what, sort, what level of granularity, like visual detail I needed, like what was visible on uh, the screen of my, of my clients, and then uh, reduce the data so that it appears the same visually to these users, but it's a lot less under the hood. Um, an example of this is like combining two galaxies into one galaxy that is twice as bright. And uh, adjust a lot of other aspects of the simulation on the go. So as you zoom in, different things happen, different shaders are applied, and that sort of thing. The whole point of Asterank was to bring all these tools to developers and make it possible for someone who's a normal person like me or you, just someone who's like interested in space, has a background in JavaScript, um, and really empower them to create something that they can contribute to the space community or, um, or just like make cool visualizations or actually contribute to the science that's behind a lot of this. So what I did was I built a bunch of APIs. <laughs> so everything here, is um, everything here is really is, is used by a lot of people in, in hackathons, um, a lot of people doing like space-related projects, and that sort of thing. But what this does is it generalizes a lot of the work that I have done and makes it not just open source, but also something that people can actually um, customize and build their own stuff with. And this was really important to me. So examples of of what this can do. Um, this is an exoplanets visualization that uses the same visualization engine but overlays all these exoplanets on top of our solar system. Uh, so you can see sort of how, uh, you know, which planets, I guess, are uh, potentially habitable and that sort of thing. This is a, uh, another visualization that I did for the SETI Institute. This is um, a comet that came through our solar system and left a trail of dust. Every time the Earth, that blue orbit, passes through this dust cloud, we see a meteor shower at night. And this is the Alpha Capricornid meteor shower. Believe it or not, this is how meteor showers work. I didn't know that. Um, I built this moon visualization for a company that's interested in the moon. Uh, this, these are all the places that we've landed on the moon. All these orbiting particles where um, are objects that have orbited the moon and so on. So very neat interactive visualization that uses a lot of the same orbital elements. And even just other stuff like this uh, weird looking asteroid that you can sort of drag around and inspect. Um, so everything here is written in the browser, right? A lot of these you can just run on your mobile phone and um, that, that is the power of JavaScript, it's the power of WebGL. And for that reason, I think that space in particular is really becoming a software problem. So after I sold Asterank to Planetary Resources, I went and worked full time on spacecraft, like actually building real space stuff. But I realized that a lot of the same basic concepts, a lot of the same problems that I solved when I was just building this project uh, were applicable in the real world. Things like figuring out how to move telemetry around in a smart way, how to store it in a database, how to send it down back to Earth without, um, while like only, only sending exactly what you need, just like I only sent exactly what was needed to the client. And even things like the heuristics that I implemented, um, I, I see parallels in the autonomy that we'll eventually have to give spacecraft. And in general, I think space is becoming a software problem, but really everything is becoming a JavaScript problem. And, um, or maybe JavaScript is becoming a problem for, for more and more people. Um, but it's totally true because a lot of the, like the ground control systems, the, the op systems that I built, they were all written in JavaScript. And the reason why I am here talking to you guys today is because being able to build something in the browser 
is extremely powerful, right? And I think that it's these sorts of creative applications that will be the first ones that reach these old industries like space, like healthcare, like, like law and oil and gas and things like that. Just like everything that you can think of will eventually be touched by the browser. It'll be touched by a JavaScript. So even when you're when you go home and you, you build your React app or, or whatever, like twiddle things on web apps, I mean, that's what I do most of, most of my day, but a lot of it is really broadly applicable. And I think that uh, you all are in a great place to really create amazing creative stuff that has the potential to transform these, these industries. So that's all I have. Thank you.